Here's what we know so far about the background of the Orlando nightclub shooter. He was born in New York to Afghan immigrant parents. We are going to not say his name. We're not going to show his picture. We have no interest in idolizing or helping those who would idolize shooters of this sort, but we will give you information uh, to help in our analysis of what happened and what we should do going forward. His ex-wife, Satori Yusufi, described a brief but violent relationship to a mentally ill man whom she was only able to escape through her family's help. He was bipolar, physically abusive, and a steroid abuser, she said. Mm. That was his uh, earlier wife. He went on to marry mm. again afterward and have a child. He was described by a former police officer that he'd worked alongside as an angry person, violent in nature, and a bigot to almost every class of person. Uh, he was also, uh, people have made multiple references to him making many homophobic comments, violently homophobic comments, uh, in the years prior to the actual shooting. Now, he first came on the FBI's radar back in 2013 when he made inflammatory comments to coworkers alleging possible terrorist ties. Investigators were unable to verify the substance of his comments. And so he gave some indication even back then, three years ago, that he had some ties to terrorist organizations, uh, but not enough to actually have him be convicted of anything. Then the next year, uh, the FBI interviewed him again over possible connections with Moner Mohammed Abu Salha, a Florida man who became the first known American suicide bomber in Syria. Uh, Ronald Hopper, who was the assistant special agent in charge of that investigation, said that we determined that contact was minimal and did not constitute a substantive relationship or threat at that time. Now, that seems tragic in hindsight, um, but that's exactly the sort of situation that we should expect would have happened. He's a guy who is boasting about ties to terrorists. He has gone to mosques where he has come into contact with these people. And certainly ISIS has said that one of their soldiers committed this attack. But we have no information about him traveling overseas and training with them, any direction being offered internationally from ISIS or its agents. It seems like an incredibly insane, violent, domestic abuser with bipolar disorder who hated gay people for whatever reason, and certainly we can speculate. And when an individual like that, every person wants to believe that they're part of something bigger, that what they believe is part of something bigger. That's one of the reasons that religion is so popular throughout human history. And so when you see this great shining star of hatred internationally like ISIS, then a guy who was already crazy, already violent, already hated homosexuals, suddenly has larger like authorization to do something about it or confirmation that he was al always right, whether he actually ever contacted ISIS or not. That's so, what it seems like to me. So what's interesting about this whole story is the fact that not only was he investigated on two separate occasions by the FBI for possibly having ties to terrorist activities or at least being radicalized in the country, he had an ex-wife who even wrote a police report about how abusive he was and he was still able to get guns. Like, I, okay, so whenever Edward Snowden um, leaked the information about how the NSA is indiscriminately spying in all of us, on all of us, there were arguments in support of what the government was doing because, hey, this is national security. You gotta keep us safe from these radical terrorists, right? Which, okay, I understand that argument, but here's what happens, okay? They indiscriminately collect information on innocent Americans like us, and then people like the shooter fall through the cracks. How do you investigate this person on two separate occasions? And on top of that, have a police report indicating that he was very abusive to his wife, and he's still able to purchase an AR-15. No I just don't understand, I don't understand. So if you genuinely care about terrorism, and you genuinely are worried about radical Islamic terrorists in the country, then please think about the laws that we have in place right now that makes it easy for these individuals to buy firearms. Please. Yeah, yeah I mean, it seems fairly, I, I understand that right now, people who are irrationally devoted to guns and believe that there should be effectively no limits, no limits on what they can do, are already, as soon as they see that a shooting like this has happened, the NRA stops tweeting, they go into their hunker down mode, and uh, considering how many shootings we have recently, soon they might have to literally cancel their Twitter account if th that's going to be their policy. And many will immediately rise to defending. They go on Twitter not, not to express empathy, but to defend the rights of gun owners. If you say that you, you want to kill people and you're part of a terrorist organization, then your right to have a gun should be taken away for the rest of your life. We will lock you up if you yell fire in a crowded theater because we understand that rights, the right to free speech, has limits. The right to gun ownership has limits. And if you say that you want to kill people, then you don't have the right anymore to have a gun or you shouldn't have that right any longer. It's absurd that it's more difficult to purchase Sudafed than it is to get your hands on a firearm in this country. It's absurd. 
okay? And or that so, you can be banned from flying on a plane, which Obama's gonna talk about in a video Right, later. and also for all the, you know, people in middle America who are adamant about ensuring that there's no gun control at all, I just want you to be clear about something. The Second Amendment, according to your interpretation, doesn't only apply to white individuals living in middle America. It applies to all American citizens, all Americans, okay? So everyone can get their hands on a gun. Uh, people who are fighting to ensure that those on a terrorist watch list get their hands on a gun, I mean, you're part of the problem. I don't see how there could possibly possibly be a good argument in favor of allowing someone on a terrorist watch list to obtain a gun. But it's, it's, it's the ease, too, at every level. Yes. I mean, terrorist yeah. watch list is the exclamation point on it. Mm -hmm. But to, to talk about what John was just saying, there's a congressman uh, named Andy Holt, Randy Holt, out of, um, out of Tennessee. I don't know what district number he represents, but he's in Tennessee, 6th District, I think. He had a, he's having a fundraiser tomorrow, and he was going to be giving away a, an AR-15. You could win that at his fundraiser for Congress. Well, it turns out that that was the gun that was used yesterday, and he's still going to use it. He's still going to give it away. They're still giving that away. He is standing behind. He said it's about the person, not the gun. This whole mentality, this control that guns in the extreme have. And one of the most striking things, and I learned this today, I, I remembered hearing it once, but there is the, the CDC, the Centers for D Disease Control, which studied the number of, uh, the, the amount of gun violence in this country. That's what they were charged with until 1996, when the NRA said to their people in Congress, don't let them study gun, the um, statistics of gun violence anymore. Yes. They stopped doing it in 1996. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's been like a self-imposed ban since then. They, they don't, they're not even allowed to do it because the NRA said that it would promote gun control. So they're not it's even incredible. allowed to tell you. So those numbers that you hear, how many killings, how many this, how many that, those are all approximations because the CDC, the only agency that would have the real money to do that, is banned by Congress yeah. from doing and reporting it. I don't think it's that incredible. the CDC should investigate infectious disease because that might promote vaccines. Yeah, well, that's true. and yeah, But they would like that because that's the drug companies. So. Exactly. So, and, and let's remember that this, this will not do anything to move gun legislation. Uh, after the San Bernardino, uh, murders, right? Well, how many people were murdered? 14? It was 14 in that case. Uh, two weeks after that, they had a vote to see if they could ban people who are on terrorist watch lists from buying guns. And the Republicans voted it down 55 to 44 or something yeah. like that. And uh, only one Republican senator crossed the line, though. Uh, this is a government of donors, not voters. This is the real problem. Uh, we don't, you know, incremental change is not going to fix this problem. This is not going to go away. This won't, this will be with us for decades. This is not going away until we get money out of politics and return our government to the people, the voters and not the donors. Yeah. Every problem will be effed up like this. This is, this is climate change. This is half the, half, half of our, uh, our government denying science about climate change for F's sake. This is all about money and the corrupting. And you think we could, uh, around the edges, we can fix things. We can't. This is, and we have a fundamentally broken system. I want to say a little bit more about the background of the shooter just so that we, uh, we make sure that you get this. According to his father, he told NBC News that his son had come across two men kissing in Miami recently and was infuriated that his three-year-old son had seen it too. He said they were kissing each other and touching each other, and he said, look at that. In front of my son, they are doing that. Shooter's father said that the killing had nothing to do with religion, and he apologized for his son. Understand also, though, that the father has a controversial YouTube channel where he advocates for the overthrow of the Afghan government and wishes to become a part of the government of the Taliban. Because there are people who their only driving issue is, is absolute hatred for, for Muslims. That's their mission. That's mm -hmm. all that they do. And some of them even have um, a few Twitter followers and a bunch that they bought. And so they try to advocate for that message. <laughs> and uh, so many of them were trying to say their battle that they wanted to wage was, ha, this was an Islamic terrorist, not a right-wing terrorist. I got news for you. He didn't shoot up a gay club because he was so pro-environment or so pro-animal rights. He cared about the rights of chimpanzees. He's a fucking right-winger, motivated by hatred, as a lot of other extremist right-wingers are. He just also happens to be Muslim. But no, he fits into both categories. So, so on account. related to that, you know, uh, it, it's not in this hour, but in the second hour of the show, we're going to talk about how police in Santa Monica, California, foiled a terror plot by a white individual who was planning on going to the gay pride parade in West Hollywood with a small arsenal of his own. So it's right-wing terrorism is a serious problem. And 
Look, for his father to say that he wasn't fueled by religion enrages me because, first of all, he was fueled by his hatred of gay people, which comes from religious beliefs, right? And you, that religious belief is not unique to one religion. It's actually a common theme in several religions that we know about. And so his father is not a good person. He acts as though like, oh, how could this have happened? Like what, uh, we did not expect this. Well, the same guy is talking about how, oh, you know, don't do anything to hurt gay people right now because God will punish them. God will torture them. That ideology is part of your religion. Okay, and so there are some who ignore that part of their religion and they use their religion for good. And then there are those who use extreme, you know, parts of the doctrine in order to carry out acts of violence. That's what happened in this case. And for anyone who's concerned about domestic terrorism, who's worried about, you know, refugees coming into this country and radicalizing people or causing terrorist, you know, activity here. Okay, I hear you. I hear that you're concerned about that. We've had a number of mass shootings at this point. But if you're genuinely concerned, let's make it harder for those people to legally obtain weapons. How about that? Yeah, it's good. So I just, you know, I'm just reminded of all the Mike Huckabee and every other right winger standing on stage with Kim Davis at a rally, uh, a rally for gay hate. Yeah. And uh, so that's okay to have a rally for gay hate. Uh, repeatedly, right, when someone's denying gays their rights, their constitutional rights, you guys rally around denying them. And so, uh, but this guy's just a what? This guy must be a maniac, right? But, but it's okay to hate them, and they're not fully citizens, and they don't deserve the rights, and God's going to punish them. Uh, so, uh, again, and then Donald Trump, by the way, is revealing the hypocrisy and the moral bankruptcy of that movement, the right-winger movement, because they don't give a shit about morality. They don't give a shit about the Bible. They don't give a shit about anything. They don't give they a can shit have about power. human lives. They, Let's yeah. just keep it real. Right. They care about exploiting a tragedy like this for political gain. Yes. Okay? Someone like Donald Trump does not genuinely care about the victims. And his rhetoric online has made that absolutely clear. If you care about the victims, if you're genuinely mourning and grieving over these lost lives, then you would do something as, as someone who has some political clout at this point to change the current system that we're living in. You wouldn't go uh, call in on all these cable news shows and spout your hatred for certain groups of people, spout your allegiance for the NRA. You are a disgrace. Donald Trump is an embarrassment to the United States and an embarrassment to the Republican Party, to be honest. Yeah. This is Mike Huckabee's tweet yesterday. That's it. Please join Janet and me in praying for the victims of the Orlando attack and their families. That That's the same guy who stood up there, as Jimmy just said, with Kim Davis. You know, go take it away. Go, go away with that, Mike Huckabee. I mean, this is, you, you your skewed yeah. hate. Um, you spewed hate. No, don't delete and you your wrap it in, Then we wouldn't be able to right, get gems true. like this. But uh, yeah. you know, and you so, wrap it in morality, right? Yeah. And you wrap it in morality. The other yeah. thing, just uh, it's Andy Holt is a state representative from the sixth district, and, and not a not a U.S. representative, yeah. by the way.